On episode 5, we kick it with the first animator to fall out of play area, John Geiger. He's a senior animator for Eidos Montreal, where he's animated for games including Marvel's Avengers, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and Do Sex. Before that, at Ubisoft, he worked on Prince of Persia, Avatar, and Splinter Cell Conviction, and a whole bunch more before that. Geiger and I connected while we were members of CrossFit Ville Marie in Montreal, where we became swole mates who always pushed each other to lift heavy while keeping it light and cracking jokes to get through the pain and the game. He candidly discusses his tips on bringing your best self to the job at hand, putting the best demo reels together, and what it's like to animate and manage motion capture performances. We'll also talk about how he broke in as an animator into this industry and more. I think there's plenty here for animators as well as other developers. Coming to us all the way from Lancaster, Ontario, from our lovely neighbors to the north in Canada, please welcome Senor John Geiger. Let's start the show. Bienvenido, bienvenue, welcome to the Out of Play Area podcast, a show by video game devs for game devs, where the guests open up one-on-one -on -one about their journey, their experiences, their views, and their ideas. No ads, no bullshit. Join us as we venture far out of the play area with your host, seasoned game designer, John Diaz. So how far away are we talking about right now from your home office is the squat rack, like from where you're sitting right now? 15 feet. Oh my gosh. Are you telling me you could just go bust out a set right now? If I used, had used my phone camera, I could have just stand up and there's a, I built a, a temporary wall to separate me from the gym, but I could just hold it up and you could see over the wall and you could see that there's a squat rack right there. Well, actually, there's four squat racks right there. Why did you build that wall out of curiosity? I wasn't sure what was going on with the gym. Ontario just had another lockdown where it said, we're not supposed to go out. We're literally not supposed to go out and do anything. So when that hit, I had set up a co-op mm -hmm. CrossFit gym kind of thing. I would write a workout on the whiteboard and people would come in. I wouldn't coach or anything, although I am a certified CrossFit level yes. coach. <laughs> yes, Gregor, you a certified level. That's what changed. From when I left Montreal, you got your level one certification. I was training people. It was so much fun. I, I totally get it. I totally see what people want to be a coach. Like when someone comes in and they want to get better and stronger and all that stuff. It's always good. I truly enjoy that. But so I stopped coaching. I basically told people they want to pay me monthly. They can come in uh, at certain hours and they can come in and they can work out. They can do my workout on the board. It had to be someone that knew what they were doing. I didn't want any like noobs coming in and hurting themselves because it's, we live in the middle of nowhere. I live in Lancaster, Ontario. Look it up. It's small. It's a village, not a city. And the nearest city is Cornwall. My wife opened the gym. It was the only thing in town, right? Like it's the only place you can go work out. So we got a few people come in and the people have been with us for a long time. And I'm just like, you know what? They need somewhere to work out. So the wall's there in case people want to work out while I'm working. That's fine. Dude, I think it's something beautiful about game developers who lift, right? If you just separate CrossFit, right? Just say we lift weight, we pick heavy stuff up and we drop it. We move, we work on core strength and all this stuff. And for people that tend to sit down for hours at a time at their desk is so damn helpful for longevity, for feeling good, for not developing all these crazy carpal tunnel and hip weaknesses and poor posture. Upper cross syndrome, the people that are always like hunched over and stuff. Yeah, got to work on that posture. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite exercise or favorite lift? Deadlift. Deadlift. Do you remember how we met? We met deadlifting. We fucking met deadlifting. Fun Friday, it was deadlifts, and he put John and John together. Because Fridays were partner workout days. Every Friday, yeah. Fridays are generally awesome in general, just throughout all life. Absolutely. But partner wads are a special type. They just add a little extra sauce. And we would go have breakfast at La Trait yep. on the corner of, what's that main road? It was Mayer and uh, Blurry. It's gone now. The trade yes. closed. The guy sold it. He made his money. He was happy. To that, my friend, mm. I want to pour my drink. So what are you sipping on? I think I told you last week or a couple weeks ago, you fell off your chair a bit. I'm drinking homemade hooch. And hooch for those that don't speak? I made basically like a whiskey bourbon. I made it myself. I aged everything. And this is all I have left of the batch that I made. I, I forgot to bring a glass. I keep forgetting that I'm not at home. So I'm drinking it right from the flask to be as classy as possible. You, you know. should have told me, man. I would have brought my flask down. I, it takes me a little bit to set up because I don't have everything. I'm in the guest bedroom downstairs where I run my little office out of. I can it's, drink out of this. 
Hold on. If you can see that. What is this? Why is Tro- this trophy looking thing that says world's okayest CrossFitter? How did yeah. you win that? Oh, my wife made it for a competition we had. And I, I feel I won, so I took it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you felt like the champ. I was the okay? No, I was the okayest. I was the okayest. That's what it's all about. If you feel like you win, you deserve it. I think everyone should have got one because just for showing up and lifting stuff, it's a big step, especially with us because like we're we're strong, man. The people come in and then I become a bit of a sideshow during we, – we, we always end everything with a deadlift ladder. Yes. And so that's like how we end the show. It's, we, we were all, we've all done our workouts. We're all sweaty. And then they set up all the bars. It looks like a train yard in here. It's just like axles everywhere. And it starts at 95 pounds. Mm-hmm. Got to go up. All the way up to, I think we, we usually stop it at, at 315. I want to believe that we got to 315 and like quality 315. On our first date? <laughs> I don't know if you hit 315. I can't remember. No, 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 no. Not on our first date, but the first Cherry Bomb gym yeah, yeah. Oh, event, yeah, yeah. we got up to 315. Yeah, yeah. Damn right. Yeah. At my peak, I was just shy of 400. Like I was like 385, 375 around there. I never quite got to the 400 club. Mm. I got to 425. Ooh, mm. man. Okay, I'm starved for hugging and high fives in this whole pandemic, right? We're in 2021 now. But damn it, man, I would hug this shit out you. Yeah, that was it. Throw you over my back, squat you a few times, and be like, Geiger, you the man, you my hero. I grab a concoction here. I got my Christian Brothers brandy, and I got some Kahlua, and I put that with a ginger beer, and I'm sipping on this, and I want to say, Sante, salud, Geiger. Bro. It's going to be a good show. Oh, I think so. I love this. Tell me what your role is officially. What you do, where you work. I work at IDOS, Montreal. Senior animator is my official title. Senior animator. Senior animator. Uh, I've been specializing in facial animation at IDOS just for three games now. I originally started off here as a gameplay animator, which is not my favorite thing in the world, but I can do it. I did it. Luckily, I got roped into the facial department. And so I was doing facial animations and cinematic stuff. I crushed the... The data from the mocap studios, I, I process the facial data that we get from the cameras. I do quite a bit of cleanup and stuff like that, too. It's been great. I can always learn so much more about what my awesome peers do across the design wall. And for the layman, whenever I look at mocap data, I just see the guys in the suits in the video. Mm-hmm. And I know that by the time that data gets back to the animation team, you guys will convert it in a way that I can pump into the engine and queue. But so when you guys say cleaning up, what does that exactly entail? Data is a fickle beast. I remember we had a temporary mocap studio and they had mounted the cameras to a wooden frame. And these things have to be solid in mathematical space, these cameras. This is so weird. I've learned so much more about the technical side of things. I used to be what I call a paste eater, man. I was an artist. I ate paste. I used to just do physical artwork. I didn't care about technical stuff. Okay, so traditional art, not 3D art. I started off as a classical animator. Well, that's what I would expect. I would expect anybody coming into art of any form, be it digital, animation, whatever, starts from the same foundation. Is that not? Nobody does that anymore. Are the courses even available? For me, that was a job. Nowadays, the jobs, they're not here anymore, the classical animation gigs. It's all done with Flash or whatever. Like the the hand-drawn market is... I hate to say it's dead, but it's pretty close anyway. Like Disney, they close up their stuff. Warner Brothers, when they were doing Batman, the animated series, that was the very last physically hand-painted cells show ever was that one. Dude, I still watch that. Like I got my HBO Max subscription. I love, I love me some animated series. Kevin Conroy. Yeah, that's the voice. Mark Hamill, Joker. That was some of the best perks about working at WB Montreal was having access to all that stuff on the daily, man. Because that that shit is priceless. My friend just got uh, just got hired there. I was behind enemy lines last week helping her pick up her equipment because she's also working remotely. There's a few people that I know, and you fall under the category of people that everybody knows, or at least to one degree of separation, you've hung out with or know somebody that knows somebody. Well, I mean, the second I got into the IT department, I knew the guy who was giving us the stuff. He's like, hey, man. His name was John as well. <laughs> he's like, hey, how you doing? I haven't seen you for He used to work at IDOS. And I knew him, but I couldn't remember where I worked with him. And I was just like, he's like, I was at IDOS. I'm like, yes. Okay, cool. Awesome. People, I mean, it's, people jump around studios all the time. Yo, especially in Montreal. Montreal, I tell everybody, is like musical chairs for game development, man. Everybody just hopping around from project to project. Everybody knows somebody. And 
recommend somebody. And anytime a team spins up, you want to bring your guys or you know who the top AI guy is or the 3C guy or the animation or the economy balancing or uh, rendering programmer, all that good stuff. I'm sad that we never got to work together like that. That crushed me. You left and I was like, oh, man, I never got to work with that guy. Yo, and now when I look back, now we're 2021. I left, what, at the end of 2017. So many people jumped ship from Warner Brothers to IDOS Montreal. They did. In particular for yes. a specific project. There was a specific project that everybody was just like salivating over. Oh my God, yes, I want to go on this thing. Yeah, it was Home Alone. Home Alone, the video game. <laughs> but, but I have a bunch of design buddies over there. Is Brent George still over there? No, Brent, Brent's moved on to. Mm. He was great. He, uh, I, I've known, well, I've known Brent since Sheridan Animation. He was the year in front of me. Like we've known each other for a long time. You went through the same program. Yeah, yeah. He was just one year ahead of me. He was this tall, lanky ginger. He wore denim and stuff too much. It was hilarious. I believe both of you are in this awesome, timeless Ubisoft recruiting video that I will definitely <laughs> find, oh, and I will God. definitely link in the show notes. And this shows a young Geiger in his essence. Oh. If you allow it. If you yeah, allow no, no, no. It. It's not there anymore, dude. I look for it. Mm. The, one where, the one where I call everybody a douche? Yes. Yeah, it's not there anymore. Oh, they took it down, son of it, a gun. Maybe someone shared it, but it's. It, yeah. I think just this year I looked for it one more time. Mm -hmm. And I think it's gone now. I think I was like, oh, man, I can't find it. I, I remember literally on the street outside, some guy, hey, you're the douche guy. Like, That's it. That's it. I'm the douche guy. It's hey, good. but now you go by the facial guy. Yeah, that was still at Ubisoft when I first started getting onto the doing facial animation, learning about facial, actually performance capture. I got to thank Colin Graham. He really spearheaded getting the performance capture where you get the face and the body captured at the same time. So that every nuance is hooked and it's so much that better. That wasn't a thing? No, it was not. It was like, I think you'd see it maybe in some, you might have mentioned it in a couple of movies somewhere along the line, but it hadn't become the norm. I like to think it's the norm now for a lot of games with performance capture, where you capture the face while you're capturing. But then that, that brings on a whole other set of things where like we had a lot of motion capture artists, like the, like actors, that that's their thing. They were motion capture. They did great motion but mm -hmm. they weren't necessarily great actors. You got to find that sweet spot where you have a talented actor that's also talented at motion capture acting because motion capture acting is difficult in that the second you're covered in balls, you think you have to move or something. And it's actually your lack of movement is what we want to capture right now. Stop moving everywhere just because you're covered in balls. Stop it. I've never been in the suit. I definitely plan to get in the suit before my time is done. I just want to know what it feels like. But you're saying you have this abnormal feeling that makes you typically you can't stand still, right? If it's your first kind of go. That's the thing is people think they have to be like in, in, in like Capcom with like a breathe cycle when they're breathing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, stop. Mortal Kombat. Yeah, exactly. Mortal Kombat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bring it back. Bring it back. Okay. So here's something I heard frequently in my time. And you hear this every time there's a big technology jump is like, oh, yeah. Motion capture technology is going to do away by way of dinosaurs for like traditional animation. But that's far from the truth. It just augments what you already have. I mean, there's been a number of actors, motion capture actors in the past, like in Hollywood, that like, oh, like, oh, it's all me. I do everything. It's all me. But there's so many animators that have to fix your work, all that data and make it look good. It's so important that you have someone that understands motion. I mean, seeing raw motion capture data. You can tell that it's raw motion capture data. There's something missing. And you get an animator. If I was to Google it, would I just be seeing a rig moving through space? Yeah, is that exactly. You just see like a skeleton and just like boop, 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 boop. Mm -hmm. And often things are like some joints can be very mismatched or something and you have to go in manually and correct it. That in itself, the joints, the, the, the rig, whoever makes the rig that takes the motion, I mean, that in itself... If you don't have a good rigger, you're not going to get the data to your eyeball looking good because the rigger doesn't work. There's so much involved, man. Well, help me, help me step through that. I, yeah. I, I would love to appreciate more of what you do. And I would love to appreciate your craft. And, and especially for the people listening, right? It's like, hey, I want to be an animator. And I imagine just as design has a full family of subcategories of design, that there is also many subcategories of animation. The ones mm -hmm. I believe I know, you have your rigger, mm -hmm. you have your kind of keyframe animator, you have your like mocap cleanup guy. 
what else is there? Please educate me. What I was alluding to was that you have to have an appealing model. Someone has to model something that's appealing to look at move. A character artist. You got a character artist that has to make a, an appealing model. Then you have a designer to design this character from scratch. There's so much that goes into it. Oh, it blows my mind. Dude, I'm going to go back way back on my very, very first video game I ever made. And What I, is this? This is Memory, the Apprentice Knight. Let me uh, Google this. Let uh, me Google. Knights, I think it got the, the title got changed before release. It was called Knight's Apprentice. It's by Microid. Microids. Was the Mem- Mem- Knight's Apprentice Memrix Adventure yeah. uh, Metacritic average release date 2004 Xbox. It's the first one, yeah, yeah. We got oh. Xbox shoes for that, like actual Xbox shoes. That was cool. What do you mean Xbox shoes? They looked like Vans, but they were all Xbox branded, like, like black and neon green. Yes, exactly. Dude, that's what I love video game swag to no end. Absolutely. Like I you can think I'm I'm a guy out of school the way I hunt these things down and oh free swag, hell yeah, give it to me. Yeah, it's always like the bonus when, when people come back from E3 and they're like get that big bag of stuff. And they're like, yeah, have some stuff. How was it working back then on original Xbox console and the, as far as being an animator on an Xbox game? Well, again, it was like bare bones. I was an animator. We didn't have motion capture to go from, so everything was keyframe. And I'd have to do a run cycle, just a straight up run cycle. And then it's like I'd do a walk cycle. And, and that's classic. Up. Yeah. If you can't do that stuff, you might as well go home. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to make a demo reel, you have to show that you can do a, a run cycle, walk cycle kind of thing. That's kind of important. But so then I do these run cycles, walk cycles, jog cycles. I do like a run cycle lean to the left, a run cycle lean to the right, a walk cycle. And then suddenly I'm working on this project and I got the main character and this guy hands me a joystick. And I'm in the middle of a meeting. I was the only Anglo in a room full of French guys, first of all. And they hand me this controller. And for the first time ever, I push the stick forward. And this guy that I animated lunges forward and starts running. And the camera's following him, and then he leans, and he's running to the left and running to the right. And I'm just like a kid in a candy store. I could not fathom what I had created. And with the help of real programmers and integrators and, and just a billion other people involved, and I'm just sitting there, and they're talking. I don't know what the hell they're saying, and I'm just like, playing. oh. That's wonderful to hear, right? Like that first moment. I can still feel that. Like I still get excited when I think about that moment in particular because that was so cool. I know as a designer, we are trained to look at things in their most primitive shape and kind of imagine what life would be like or what the game is going to be like. And the first thing I always want, outside of the art, outside of the thing that that looks good, the model or the asset, the next immediate layer of feedback I want is an animation. I want to see life, right? Without an animation, there's no life. It's static. Getting that in game is always my first priority. You're bringing life to the world. I mean, it must have been how anybody who ever made the first moving picture or someone who made the first telephone, that must have been how they felt. Because I felt like I had, it must have been like maybe 20 seconds, but that moment felt like forever. It was so cool. Because you're used to, what what tools are you working in at the time? Is it Maya? Uh, That was 3D Studio Max with Character Studio. Okay. And you're in your editor and you animate and then you press play and you could loop it. And then so this is the difference between that and the game is now you control when that animation is triggered. Yeah. I remember all along the way of creating different tools to do different things like, oh, if we capture you doing this, we could put this in a cinematic later. So you don't have to animate him walking on site. So you'd hit like this button, hit record, and then you'd walk and you'd follow the path you wanted to follow in the, the cinematic and you'd record that. And then, and then you'd save it as a motion file. And then suddenly it's like, you don't have to animate a guy walking on set. You can just play it and hit record. Oh, yes. It was, again, it was just like all these little things happening. It's super exciting. I think red versus blue was like... Uh, <gasps> that was <laughs> the, the Rooster pinnacle. Teeth guys? Yes. Rooster uh-huh. Teeth guys, man. I would love to meet them. I would love to meet them. I think think they're all in Austin, Texas. They may have grown out of there, but dude, I'm with you because in my college years, getting my game development degree, Halo was my game. Or Halo 2, I want to say. Halo 2 was when they first got internet on Xbox Live and all that. Mm -hmm. I was cracking out. I would go to school, do my shit, come home, crack out on Halo with all my buddies in New York. And when that series came out, we were just like all sharing it with each other. Oh, yeah, look at this. Oh, right. it's so underground. It's so good. And now the guys have a whole bunch of different shows and a convention and yeah, yeah, all yeah. this. I watched some of the old episodes with my kids because they had no idea what I was talking about. My wife and I used to binge watch that when we lived in Vancouver. That was Whoa. some good stuff. Just for context, 
you're controlling the character as you would in a video game. And I don't know how they did their capture. I, I felt like that was the most impressive thing. I, oh, okay, because it was a first-person shooter, so they would just point one player as the cameraman as they all synchronized in a multiplayer room. And they did a puppet show with characters that somebody else rigged and animated, but they, they were able to make a TV show out of these characters that they had, you know, it was just so brilliant. How do you interpret that as a professional animator who has the tools and knows what goes into keyframing and controlling joints and moving bones and everything? How do you look at that? Because they don't have that same interface when they're animating, but this is the foundations of traditional animation. I always saw red versus blue. I saw it as amazing performance art. They weren't making the animations or the characters or the lighting or anything, but they were taking objects that they could interact with and make it happen. And they did. And it was amazing. It was comic gold and i don't know who thought of it but he's a genius and he deserves an, like some sort of award hey well shout out to the rooster teeth guys yeah. I, they were a very big part of my internet time you give me a call sometime i just want to say thank you it was so good <laughs> I'll put you in touch. I, I got buddies in Austin. Someone has to know them. Bro, so you worked on a few other things in Microids. Microids is an old port, Montreal. Love that city. Love that place. Oh, yeah, yeah. What was after that? So it was an old port, Montreal. But then we moved from Montreal to Vancouver. Oh, okay. First gig in the industry in Montreal, a.k.a. the biggest game development hub in the entire side of the hemisphere. <laughs> So you jumped to the West Coast, to the left coast. What triggered that? So we had friends who were originally from there that worked with us at Microids. And then they decided to seek bigger and brighter out to, in the left coast. And w one of my friends, the friends of that friend, they said, I'll try it out. And he heads out. And then I'm like, hey, want to see if we can do it too? And so we took our brand new baby boy, packed up the Ford Escort wagon, and uh, I, I drove out there. She flew with the kid and the, and the cats. And I, I worked out there, I think it must have been almost two years. I was there for almost two years. And it was just, it wasn't, a, we didn't mesh well with the, the Vancouver. <laughs> what does that mean? Okay, so not studio side, but personally. Well, my job was, that was a bit of a debacle. I got hired by Relic, a THQ. Company Heroes, great game. I had an amazing time. I started off doing gameplay where I was fixing loops and, and making like different loops for all the characters and stuff. And then I managed to parlay myself into well, all the 2D animation that went into the, you know, when you're between games, you're like a map. And then the map is telling you what you have to do. And I had some kind of almost like animated comic book feel stuff. Yeah, I did all that stuff. They put me to a course to learn After Effects, which is where I did all that stuff. Okay, so After Effects is post-production, right? Or you can animate inside of After Effects as well. That's the thing is I learned how to animate with After Effects. I'd used After Effects in high school and college putting together my demo reel and stuff like that. But it's a great tool. I, I loved it. A, a lot of VFX are built in After Effects, right? Like gun scenes, explosions, all of that in major big Hollywood movies are built in After Effects. Well, that used to be the number one compositing tool out there. You'd, mm -hmm. you'd use that with Backburner or whatever Adobe tool that came with it to, to do better and better. And then they tried to <laughs> say that I was just a 2D animator and give me a pay cut. <laughs> oh, fuck out of here. Fuck out of here. The best part was I had so many friends at Ubisoft. Like five seconds after that, I went to my friend's office and said, could I use your phone? And I called Ubisoft. I called the studio and I said, can I speak to Alexander Romancio? He was my lead artist when I worked at uh, Microids. I said, can I speak to Alexander Romancio? I tell him, dude, I want to come back to Montreal. And he goes, dude, let me call you back. Two hours later, I had a contract to sign. I did not apply for a job. I didn't fill out an application. I did not send a demo reel. I said, I would like to move there. I'd like to move back to Montreal. And he got me a contract. I didn't do anything. I just called Alex. And he, I think Alex called some other people because we all of Microids got acquired by Ubisoft while I was gone. So everyone that I worked with was working at Ubisoft. It's common for a big company in town to gobble up the smaller studios and, and usually helps the smaller studios scale up, keep their talent. I have no idea what happened to Microids after they were acquired. I think someone fought to get the name back so they could do more games that were more Microids games and they're still making stuff, I think, in France. I'm not sure. You are able to sustain and survive this industry just based on your connections and I guess your rapport. I'm an honest guy. I like to think that the people that I decide to hang out with, they become good friends. Dude, I, if I said, hey, do you think you could get me a gig at EA? How long before you had me talking to the right person? Yo, like an hour. 
See, it's because I, I feel like I have a pretty good work ethic. I've had some ups and downs in my career, but I feel like people know that I like to do my job and I like to do it well. How long you been doing this? Well, we're in 2021 and you told me Knight's Apprentice shipped tw- 2004. 20 years. Ooh. I started off. Okay, so that's just in video games. Oh, that's right, bro. Okay, so just to circle out the importance of sociability, being approachable, being a, an awesome guy to work with, hang out with, talk to. I don't think that gets taught in schools enough or the importance is enforced enough. And I just want to highlight that. What does it mean to you when you're picking someone to work with, you're on an interview panel, you're debating between this guy on a resume and this guy on a resume or this person, where does that play into it? The the soft skills of the, the person. Soft skills are so important. I've had to work with all different kinds of people, all different people that are like introverts, people extroverts, and and everyone, if they have a good work ethic, if they want a good final product, you'll get to know that. And then you'll know that that's someone that you want to invest your time in to hire or to, to get behind and say, yes, you can totally put my name on your resume as a reference because I will totally back you up. I've never worked with you personally. We've never mm-hmm. worked on a project together. But I feel we've worked together. I feel like we have developed a team dynamic. And, I, and I'll attribute that to, because thanks to you, I met my wife, right? You match made us at breakfast. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, John. And I made a lot of connections. Working out with you just establishes this. It's like going to war with somebody. Exactly. You're going and, and making a game is totally going to war. You're in the trenches. You're not going to be at your best every single day. You're going to be pushed to the brink and you want to be there with somebody that has your back, right? Whatever that means and respects you. You know what I'm saying? There's a thing about not being a dick. Don't be a dick. When I left with WB Montreal, this was kind of our unwritten number one piece of the culture that we were trying to build when the IDOS guy went over there and became studio head. I'm trying to coin the acronym, my bad. My bad? My bad because I was being a dick. So when Uh you say my bad, it's I'm sorry because I was being a dick. So you're owning up to it. That's right. I've worked with some people that swear up and down that they had nothing to do with whatever. And you know that they're the last person that checked that file in. And it's like, (laughs) uh, come on. (laughs) Source control doesn't lie. (laughs) <laughs> of course, doesn't lie. I've even logged into someone else's computer and made the commit. And even every time I make the commit from someone else's computer, I'll write my name. Yeah, I'll That's sign right. it. Like, yeah. I sign it. I'm like, I'm yes, boom. And I've had people at my desk where they've changed something and they're like, can we check this in? I'm like, sign it. Sign it that you that you made those changes. Because cool. something breaks. Not on me. <laughs> Not on me. I, I love to fix other people's things. Oh, hell yeah. I'll fix things till the day is done. But if I didn't touch it and I don't know what all went into it, you're the first point of contact to be like, hey, reach out to so-and-so to at least give me some knowledge dump of where to look and what broke and how to fix it kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Amen for being, what do we call that, man? Just a stand-up guy. I don't know. Fix Just it, like, fix it, Felixes. Yes, absolutely. Back to your point, bro. We have not worked on a game together, but we have hung out enough around other game developers. You know a bunch of my co- colleagues. I know a bunch of your colleagues. You brought us together. You've invited me to McKibbins for Awesome Fridays. There's just so many things that I've done with you that I know that working would be an extension of your character in the same way that I, you know I've broken bread with you. I've lifted heavy-ass weights and been on the floor crying for mama after an intense wad. There's pictures of us laying on the ground. Sweat angels. Sweat angels, Sweat angels. everywhere. Yep. Mm. Oh. Hey, shout out to being in an industry where we can still do our work from home. I remember saying to myself, how am I going to animate for the rest of my life? How am I going to be an animator? How am I going to get paid to animate for the rest of my life? I cannot tell you who told me, but someone said, bro, video games. That's the only company right now that's an animation that will give you a full-time position at the time. This was it. And I'm like, all right, that's it. I'm going to video games. That's what I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to get into video games. Yo, so first of all, yeah, I never thought video games would ever get into this space. And so that's one benefit of the pandemic was forcing us to quickly adapt to the times and be able to work from home. I still remember all those meetings where our bosses are like, oh, my God, you guys are are working at like 80 percent productivity and we're not even in the office. This is amazing. (laughs) It's working. Proof is in the pudding. So that brings me back. When I look at you and your path, I'm curious what led you to video games, because when I think of animation, I think you have the whole world 
as your oyster in terms of going into movies, going into television, going into all these other options. So how, what led you particularly into video games coming from a traditional artist? It was getting interviewed by video game companies. Those were the first ones that were like, hey, come talk to us. When I was at Sheridan College. Sheridan. Okay. Oh my gosh. Is that a VHS? That's a VHS. What the fuck is that? All right. So I'm going to try to describe this for people that can't see right now. This is like a, a big square object about eight inches long by like four or five inches. There's uh, what appears to be like tape, a tape structure that looks very flimsy and analog. And you have to rewind manually. And it has some fixed length. What is that you're showing me? That's a VHS. Oh, this, this is a demo reel I made in college. The thing was it shared in college because it had become a hub for animators. We have... Where's Sheridan College? Is it Montreal? Oh, it's Oakville, Ontario. Oakville, Ontario. Okay. Sort of Toronto. Toronto. And, uh, so, Toronto. Toronto. The six. If anyone says they're from Toronto, they're lying to you. They're from Scarborough or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know a bunch of people that say New York... And everybody's like, oh, what part of New York? And I'd be like, no, 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 motherfucker. When I say New York, I, I mean New York City. Don't get it twisted. <laughs> exactly. We had like these open houses where studios would come to see our work. We'd have a presentation. You'd watch all of our demo reels in order. Like a job fair kind of thing. That's exactly it. But the year that I graduated, we had an unprecedented amount of gaming companies coming up. We had EA coming and telling us about this plan they had to build a studio in Burnaby. Shout out to Vancouver. This is before that existed. Like before these studios, these sprawling, massive studios existed. This was, and they're like, this is what's going to be, guys. And we want you to be part of it. And so they came in. They're like, we understand you're just, you know, you draw and your animation. But they started realizing that if you could teach an animator, a good animator, how to use a computer, you get good animations. <laughs> mm. And so I got interviewed by, I remember Kodiak was one of the companies that really was interested there in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. They were doing a wrestling game, which had me totally pumped. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. So I remember. Who's your favorite, who's your favorite wrestler? I mean, I, 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 part of me wants to say Bret Hart. Part oh, of me, you serious? Yeah. Yeah. Cause I'm Canadian. I love Bret Hart. That's my guy. The excellence of execution. Macho Man Randy Savage. Ooh, yeah, brother. You are more Macho Man. Yes. And, and, and then Bret Hart, for sure. Yeah. I'm more technically savvy, bro. I think you're more technical. I think I'm just Macho Man. You have the charisma. See, Bret Hart's problem was he wasn't charismatic. He was all about his mat skills and putting you in a sharpshooter. I think the reason why you never saw him raised to the height of uh, like Hulk Hogan or something was just because he was in a tall guy. He wasn't tall enough. Yeah, he, he was, was little good. compared to those guys. Uh, but, I mean, oh, Macho Man. So good. The whole family. Wrestling games. I love fighting games. I've never got to work on a wrestling game. I imagine – you tell me. I, as a quick side question. I didn't as get a, Oh, you didn't get to. Okay, okay. This was no. kind of like, hey, we're building this. We're hiring. They wanted to hire all of us, but someone thought it was a competition. And at the time, I hadn't told anyone that I was really digging this video game idea. And in my head, I was just like, no, no, I want to work at Pixar. I want to work, you know, I wanted to be an animator. That's what I expect. The first option is Pixar. That's what I imagine. Or like yeah, DreamWorks yeah. or something like that. But at the time, we were classical animator purists. These, we, we were classical animator snobs. We were going to hand draw animations till the day we die. But I was just suddenly like, I, I wouldn't mind learning how to use a computer and making video games. That's for sure. But someone said in their interview... Oh, no, that Geiger guy, he's just using this as a stepping stone to get to Pixar. He doesn't want to do video games. Somebody just assumed that? No, somebody said that about me. Oh, like a classmate. Classmate. Like on yeah. some, like, cutting your legs out to kind of get over. He thought there was a competition for the spot. There was no competition for the spot. We, we were all hired. We, we all got flown down to, to Utah and got shown the town, which is hilarious. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's, not, there's not a lot of studios that I know about over there. No. It's like a Disney Club Penguin spot. Yeah. That, that's what I realized, that video games was an option. And then finding out that there's a ton of studios in Montreal was like, what? So a lot happened that ended up with me in Montreal. Uh, this demo reel, this is the actual demo reel. How do you uh, even make a demo reel on a VHS? Okay, so <laughs> this is my classical animation demo reel. What does classical animation mean? Uh, Hand-drawn Disney animation, think about that. Like it's like all flip, flip book style kind of yeah. thing, so cell like, by like cell. Thousands and thousands of drawings in here to make a few frames of artwork. 
Uh, so we had these huge machines, giant cameras where you'd film your artwork, and then they'd bring you giant reels of film that you had to get developed. And then the developed film, we'd have to cut it and edit it with sound, and that was a separate magnetic strip. And then we'd have to send those out to another studio to get transferred to uh, a sound reel in sync with your picture. So you had two reels and stuff. It was a mess. And then you had a machine that transferred that to VHS. And then you'd make these edits and you'd spend hours and hours editing and find out you didn't open the lens cap. Oh, shit. We have to go do it all over again. So I forgot that's even a thing. There was a shutter that you could open and close and it had to be done manually. And if you forgot to open that, you film all black. I did, I did it once. It was like a small project. And then <clears throat> this was put together. Actually, once I had all my stuff on VHS, then I, I clipped this together on After Effects. And then I had to pay a company to put it on from digital on I had it on, I think, 10 floppy disks worth of data. So the stack of data and then bring it to them and then they could export it onto a VHS for me. I also have a super VHS copy. Oh, with a purple lip on there too. This was expensive. This cost me uh, $300 to get made. What is SV, like what is a super copy? Oh, so, so Super VHS or Betacam that has more audio tracks. It had been proven to last a little longer as far as like shelf life. Okay. That's why TV studios used this forever, a lot longer than. Oh, sorry. I get, I get excited about the, the old school analog that I had to, I, I got to go through. It's, it's a unique experience. No one gets to do it anymore. No, bro. And that's why I want to capture this, man. I think you're one of the few. You are the real deal. You've been doing traditional art, classic hand drawn animation, and now you are full. Yeah. In 3D, cleaning up mocap, still keyframing, working in the thing you love, which is facial expression. I imagine it's everything, right? It's speaking, it's facial excitement, it's emotion, all of that. Yeah, this is what getting that added performance capture when you have the face and the body language coming in at the same time. That way you can get that little tilt of the head that really pushes the scene. You know, there's so many little things that you don't catch yourself doing. And it's any little thing like just saying yeah and then nodding while saying yeah. It's like you get that in sync. And then put it on a screen, it's so much more believable. You get so much more emotion. You can feel it more because it feels right instead of someone trying to create it. It's a little more. It feels natural. Does that help then? You're seeing the actual live video of the performance and then you're looking at the data. And so both of those combined help the final product as you're making decisions about what to push and pull yeah. and stretch. Yep. Yeah. Nice, yep. man. Yep. Nice. You have so much experience. You've been doing this for over 20 years. What trends have you seen develop over the life cycle from Xbox to now we're in Xbox, I guess for all intents and purposes, is Xbox 5, right? Yeah. PlayStation 2 to PlayStation 5. What trends have you seen and how do you keep up? Oh, how do I keep up? I mean, I try to stay on, on the lighter side of games. I don't try to get too involved in these really, really violent games. I mean, all the games are violent. I mean, you're running around shooting things. I try to find games that I, I like to work on. At the same time, I'll judge whether or not I like it while I'm working on it. I won't say no to something just because, oh, it's Mortal Kombat and they're going to fight and bloody, I don't want to make that game because I'll make that game. There's something to, to be said about every game and, and how the process and everything. I'm just an animator. I'm not a game designer. I, I, I'm not a writer. I, I just want to take someone's vision and make it move. Bring it to life. Exactly. I want you to watch it and I want it to, I don't know, I'd like it if, if it affected you in some way. It's exciting. Absolutely. I got affected the first time I played a video game hmm. that I made. Yeah, oh. as you hmm. were controlling the motion going. At IDOS Montreal, the last things that I'm aware of that they put out was the last Tomb Raider, and then before that, it was like the Do Six. Yeah, I worked on the latest Tomb Raider, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I worked on the first reboot of the Tomb Raider. I didn't get to do the second one. I worked on the first reboot, which was mainly Crystal Dynamics and us. So it was like a, a joint effort between Crystal Dynamics in the Bay, Redwood Shores, and then Idas Montreal. Yeah, yeah. And that was cool because that was all gameplay animation for me. I got hired to do facial animation, but I didn't do any. I just did full gameplay animation on that, which was a lot of fun. Like, it was a good time. It was good to get back into it. Even though your primary love is facial animation, it was good to get back into it. What about that did you enjoy? Things like animating someone climbing a rock face. We don't really mocap that. We were working on the co-op version of the game while the Crystal Dynamics team was working on the first player experience. And just when they said that they were taking my rock climbing mechanic and putting it in there as theirs, I was just like, that's awesome that they like my rock climb. That's huge. Yeah. Oh, to find out that they wanted that, I was just like, oh my God, really? 
I did that. That's awesome. I like that too, man. It's always people wonder like, hey, how the hell do you split a project across two completely different studios? And that's a common attack vector is to split up the single player from the multiplayer because you can build those out. Yep. For the most part, independently from one another. We were independent of each other, yeah. We didn't share a lot of data in the beginning. There was a lot of stuff. Can we get this from them? Can we use this? I wasn't a senior animator yet. I was just an animator. But I didn't have a lot of involvement in the decision-making process or anything. I was just along for the ride for that. And that was cool. I enjoyed it thoroughly. The team was amazing. It was good time. You know who's over there? Hmm. Michael fucking McIntyre. He came back. He's back in Montreal? He's back at Ubisoft. Hey, everybody goes back to... No, no, let me not say... I hate using broad, like, such definitive terms. A lot of people go back to... People leave Ubisoft, they make their little tour, they see how the grass is on the other side, and they eventually come back for some reason or the other. I mean, say what you want, Mm. the games are fucking awesome. They make some great games, man. Mm -hmm. They They got a, a strong engine and a great system. They have great artists. They have amazing, amazingly talented people over there. Yes, they do. I will attest. Like everybody I work with, again, I hate using blank terms, but most of the people I work with at WB Montreal, all at some point or the other came through Ubisoft. So I got to see a lot of that culture and the way that they break down game development and even game design is super interesting. And unlike how places I've worked at, like Rockstar, Midway, things like this, how they do it. So I learned a lot from them and then ultimate respect to to. How you be so. That was my first chance to get into performance capture. I actually helped them develop their facial capture. I was the artist on the team with the, the programmers developing their facial capture system. I built the first helmet with a camera on it for Ubisoft. I built that myself. Because you're a welder by like hobby, right? Like you weld I, shit as a I hobby. Do. I have a lot of hobbies, bro. <laughs> Dude, you disassemble and you rebuild car engines. Yeah. You weld stuff. You are a true renaissance man, but you're good with your hands. That's the thing that yeah. is consistent is your hands as you use them to draw, as you use them to model, craft, sculpt. So are you are your hands insured? I, I would suggest you get hand insurance, bro. Because nah. when you're working I've, with heavy machinery, I've, something could go. Yeah, I got, I got like a scar. Ooh. That was... Ooh, that's, that's along like the main vein of the... Yeah, no, I, I've, done, I've done amazing damage to these things. They keep coming. They're still good. You must have never seen that Seinfeld episode, bro. Which Seinfeld episode? There's a Seinfeld episode where George is a hand model. Oh, I think I have seen that. And he suffers a horrible accident. And if you had hand insurance, you'd be covered. Let's go back two games. The Deus Ex. Yeah. Which one? Is it Mankind Divided or Human Revolution? The newer one. I think that's Mankind Divided. <laughs> it is. It is. It's funny. I always have that. Like, which one came first? I know your games better than you know your games, man. What's up with that? The trick for me is the, the, the first one is HR. And it makes me think of human resources, HR. And people constantly, whenever I'm talking to them, go, HR! You know, because of things that come out of my mouth. Yes, I believe it. I believe it. You're a walking HR violation. Is that my understanding? I think so. I think there's got to be rules that have existed just because I do. I don't know. I've never had any problem with human resources. I really haven't. But you're not inappropriate. Well, I I feel like people that work with you have never felt uncomfortable that your advances have always been welcome. I think it's the Afro. You describe yourself as something, and I want to understand (laughs) what the hell that is. I look at you, Geiger, and I see a lot of different ethnicities in your bloodline. Oh, there is. There's a ton. So I think what you're referring to is the term... Octoroon. Octoroon. You're the only Octoroon that I know of, at least that knows that is aware. I think it was a African American friend of mine in classical animation that brought that up to my knowledge to let me know that was an actual term for someone who is one eighth black, which I am one eighth mm-hmm. black. Not a not a <laughs> not black by any means. I'm one eighth black, so it is part of my heritage, I guess. That's it's in there. Happened. It's in there. I see you in your hair, in your light eyes, oh. your soft light eyes. Bro, I, I was in Montreal and I just moved downtown Montreal. And I was, <laughs> I was in a Jean Couture and there was a large black lady in front of me in line. And she keeps looking at me, looking at me. And then we're in line. We're moving up. It's, it's just after Halloween. I had on a disco shirt with like a really wide collar and I had my Afro was all picked out to full Afro. And she's looking at me. She's looking at me. And I just look at her and smile. I'm like, and, nod. and she looks at me all mad and she stoops me. The loud, that loud stoop. You know, Where's your color at, boy? She looks at me. She, 
<laughs> like, like, where's your pigmentation? Yes. Like, did you Michael Jackson it out or something? I'm like, I'm just standing there, and I'm just like, I don't know what to say to this lady. It's in there. I mean, when I was a kid, I used to tan very dark when I was a child. Like, really? I, I, I was, I had very, very dark skin when I tanned. Um, but, but it's like it's gone now. It's gone now. Like, well, I, you I, live in Montreal, bro. Well, you live in Ontario. You live in the cold, cold north of where sun you get is a luxury. You get like what one quarter of the year. And we get it. It gets us. Like we're, we got air conditioning and everything because it's hot as f up here for a few months. But yeah, no, it's and so yeah, the the octoroon thing. It's true. I am one eighth black, but I also have my dad. I'm fifty percent German. My dad's family is German Austrian, and then my mother's side is the one that's got like a whole mix of stuff. So okay, thanks for helping me cover that <laughs> out, man. What's your ethnic background? Oh, me. So what I do know is. Mom and dad are both from Dominican Republic, right? All right. So they, they immigrated here. So I was born in New York City. The Republic of Dominican. <laughs> and I was born in, in New York City. So I'll say like I'm first generation American, right? Like nice. First, you first were, of the lineage. You're born in New York. That is so, that's so badass. It's special. I like to say that because I was born in New York and I was exposed to all types of dialects, accents, people, ethnicities, foods, cultures, dances, music, right? That it prepared me for anything and everything. You can put me anywhere and I can vibe with somebody. That's awesome. Yeah. I was actually telling Sarah this. I've never been to New York City proper. I've been out and around New York, been to New Jersey for a friend of mine wanted to check out the, he's a big fan of the boss. So he wanted to go to New Jersey. We did that a long time ago, long time ago. So we did the road trip. We did the Kevin Smith tour where we went to where he filmed a bunch of his Kevin Smith films. It was good times. Uh, but, yeah. but I've never been to New York proper. And I said to Sarah, I need to go with John R. Diaz if I went <sighs> to New York. I would love to play to a guide, man. I'll say this full disclaimer is that everybody always asks me, yo, where do I go? What do I do in New York? And so I grew up in New York, yeah. but I left when I was a teenager to finish college. Mm. So essentially... I didn't have money. Like I was broke. So all the things people want to do involve money. Like, oh, well, take me to this place. Take me to that place. Like, Yo, bro, I don't know none of that. I know oh, all the oh, mom and pop spots to get where food, I wanna be. where to where party, where to hang out for low cost. I can tell oh, you all those things. What, what are they called? The, the depaneurs there? Bodegas. Bodegas, that's it. Are the equivalent of Montreal's depaneurs, which right. are the equivalent of the rest of the world's grocery stores or yeah, delis. Well, I want to go there and get like a – I want you to take me to the best – Bodega to get the best bodega sandwich and you hear yo, yo give me a chopped cheese with yes with yes a bit of mayo yeah you see that shit a lot that's that's what I'm saying when I want to go to New York with you I don't want to go to New York and go taking a show or something man <laughs> let's go to Broadway let's go to Fifth I don't want to do that <laughs> that's not what I want to do you got it brother as soon as travel is allowed let's coordinate All right so DSX we're DSX. talking about do sex MD I got hired. DSX, Mankind Divided. First, I got put on that project, again, gameplay. And I was very upset. And I went through this whole thing. Why am I at this company doing gameplay animation when that's not what I want to do? And my wife goes, she's talking to me. And she's like, well, then if you don't like it, quit. I'm like, I can't quit. I, I need a job. And she's like, okay, so either enjoy your job or quit. <laughs> I love it. I love it. She's very pragmatic. My wife, very pragmatic. I love that. I love that shit. She's uh, and she's very supportive. And she's like, whatever, you don't have a job, whatever, we'll figure things out. So it, it brought me to this point where I'm like, I need to enjoy my job, right? My first job on DX, DX, um, MD, MD, DX, MD, was to come up with a new cover system because the cover system in human resources sucked. I should call it human resources again. It was hilarious. So I was paired with a programmer, Maxim Gallumel. Guys, amazing. And I just, just to, to show you, I have this. What is this? You get to see Oh this. my gosh, is this like a design doc for the cover system? On paper? I see a bunch of circles and angles and numbers at corner. This is our first technical breakdown, our first meeting, me and Max. To That's break not even down. on a whiteboard. No, well, it was. It was. Oh, you didn't have a cell phone to take a picture of the board? No, you wrote no. it down on paper. You wrote it down on paper. This was framed at my desk forever because this was a turning point in my life. This is when I decided to love my job. As a gameplay animator. As an animator. I didn't care if it was gameplay or whatever. I said, you know what? I'm just going to – whatever job they give me, I'm going to kick its ass. We took a broken ass cover system. Sorry to whoever made the first cover system, but you know it's broke ass. 
This is this is the cover system in a Deuce X Human Revolution. I still think to this day it's a good cover system. It's not the best because they made me use the old one. We, originally they said we could make our own from scratch, but then we made their broken cover system. We made it work, and they're like, mm. that, "That works." So then we had to then we had to fill in all the gaps and like then more and more stuff. But I kept this piece of paper because this is that moment when I decided to love my job, regardless of what it was. What, so what was it about that moment? Is that having like clear technical guidance, seeing where you can lend your skills to make something better? What was it about it? Learning to listen, man. Like mm. Learning to listen to what someone who knew how to make it work, the technical side, and then I could make it look good because I knew technically what we had to achieve. So him and I together made a good cover system. Not the best in the world. I'm not going to say it's the best cover system. We made a good cover system. And that, to me, was such a huge change. Then the job sucked because then it was taking that cover system and putting it on every freaking weapon that this guy has. And I tell you what, he's got a lot of weapons. (laughs) That's what became a little tedious. Thankfully, I was given the opportunity to pass it on and let someone else. (laughs) That's the old drop off and run. In the process of making this system, I made a friend, a junior animator, who moved from my team to another team of technical animators. And then she got put onto the, a facial team and she knew my background because she was a friend. She said, well, Geiger's not too busy doing the gameplay. He doesn't want to do it anymore. I know he doesn't. Let's get him on the facial team. And that started that ball rolling for me to be doing facial. And then from in-game facial on DX, Mankind Divided, I went to cinematic and cutscene facial for Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Right to where I am now, which is full cinematic facial team, awesome motion artists, freaking dream job of my life right now. I feel like cinematics are special because they're not tied down to gameplay, right? Like gameplay, you'd be like, hey, it can't move that fast. You need to draw this out. But in cinematic, it's basically like no control. Sometimes you can't skip it. Can't, can't skip, skip it, it, can't move it. You got to watch this thing. And you have the power of the console and PC at your full disposal to make something awesome. And that's why I keep this paper in my desk. Because this was that point where I decided to enjoy my job. And the game I'm working on is coming to a close as far as what I'm adding to it. And I may not get to do this amazing job on the next game. But, I mean, I got this piece of paper here to remind me that no matter what, if I want to enjoy my job, that's my choice. I can choose to enjoy my job. At the end of the day, we are making games. We are building interactive experiences that are enjoyed by millions of people around the world, man. And if I get put back on gameplay, so be it. I'll enjoy it. It'll be great. You'll kick its ass. But I think that's special is the difference of when you're just working on something with very little information as to why you're building something versus being paired with somebody where you can see the end result and why you need to build it a certain way and you can truly collaborate. The best moments of this job of what we do is being able to collaborate with passionate, intelligent people that lean on your expertise and borrow from their expertise to build something awesome that's easy to work with, fun to sustain, and you guys can both be proud of what you do. And it's amazing how much enjoying your job can change it because just enjoying your job, even if you don't like your job at the beginning, like if it's not, if it's gameplay, you can enjoy it and have the best time of your life. I mean, I went from cover system to doing all the first pass facial animations on Lara Croft, all of them. Anytime you see her face move, I did the first pass on all of them. So of all the facial animations you've done, is Lara Croft the most significant, well-known character? That I can talk about. I and mean, I can say that I animated Lara Croft's face. I mean, come on now. The Tomb Raider, that's a touchstone. She's up there in terms of video game mascots and being one of the first female protagonists in a video game with class and sheer kick-assness factor, right? I love the new direction they've taken. There's some article, someone talking about something about Tomb Raider. They, they've made an anime series, I think, Ooh. Um, for, for Netflix. Yeah, there's an anime Netflix series coming out. I'll go check that out. I mean, I'd watch it. I mean, that's the thing is like about the game. I, I honestly, as far as our game goes, it's got great gameplay. I love it. But I sit there and I watch all, all the cutscenes for any game I want to. I don't even play games anymore. I literally go on YouTube and watch all the cutscenes for The Last of Us. I didn't play that game, but I watched that game. I loved it. 
beautiful game. It's a thing. Like, uh, there's a lot of times I where I, I don't have time, but I'll watch a stream of someone playing yeah. a game, right? To- I don't even watch people play the game. I watch the cutscenes. The only game I play is Rock Band. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You still throwing down? What do you do? You slap the bass? You do uh, drums? Uh, what do you do? I have that Icon drum set, like the really, really good drum set, but I suck at drums. My wife, she handles the drums. She's pretty good at it. I love doing the guitar and the bass anytime whichever one's more difficult i want to be that one i like if it's one of those more usually bass, guitar i love a good bass driven song but the guitar is generally where i like to be i like to be i, I kick it up i'm basically on medium and hard that's where i, I kind of fluctuate between two. some days it's just like my hands are on fire it's like oh my god this is amazing i should have been a rock star and then i'm like no nah. It's it's for me. It's like the pinky dexterity of being able to slide up and down the buttons that always gets me. I feel I've got getting that down. I think that's the next thing we're adding to this studio here in the studio space is there's a TV going up there, and then all the rock band equipment's getting set up here. So whenever me and the wife want to play rock band, we can just throw down right here. It's gonna happen. Me and Catherine love to throw down on some rock band. Now, does, does, does live on Xbox still work for the Xbox 360? Does it still work? Because I used to play rock band with Sarah's cousin who lives in South Korea. Mm-hmm. And we oh, used to shit. play rock band with him back in the day when we both had Xbox uh, Live Gold. We both used to rock out. Yeah, I feel like Live is definitely still up and running and going strong. And I wonder if you can just put the disc in your new console or you know, it'll ask you to, hey, download the, the digital version if you have a Game Pass or something. But it, it should definitely still work. Oh, so mad. I went through the whole process of setting it up the other night. And so many of the songs that I purchased are no longer available. I yeah. paid for that freaking song. I'm so mm-hmm. mad. Music licensing is a shitty, shitty thing. I, I kind of got rolled up into that looking for like podcast music. And it's it's a stupid, old, archaic system. Oh, dude, and- I, I was saying to myself, oh, you know what? If I don't like the interview, I can just play like some sort of copyrighted music in the background for the whole thing and not tell them. And then like, I'm sorry, man, you can't use that. I played some sort of copyrighted song in the back. See, before today, I wouldn't even have caught that. I wouldn't even have caught it. Now I know. Now you know. I want to pick your brain for the next generation or aspiring animators who want to break in to video games or some other studio. What words of wisdom can you share? What software should they learn? Oh. What things would you encourage? Oh, man. See, that's a tough one. I think learn whatever software you have at your disposal. Valve, all that free stuff where you can use their existing characters and animate those and I played with it once. I don't know what it was called. If you paid for their game, you could download a thing that you could play with some animation tools where you could grab their animations and eventually you could plug in your own animations and stuff like that and make some pretty cool stuff. Valve yeah. Source Filmmaker. Yeah, I think that was one of those tools that's been available for, I think, eight eight years or so. Mm-hmm. Or maybe five. Anyway, I remember when it came out and people were making a bunch of short films and you could see them and they used the characters from Team Fortress 2, I think, was like one of their best. Uh, yeah, because those characters are so stylized, right, and iconic. And that's what I like. Like, that's what I love. This realistic stuff, I love it and all, but give me stylized characters every day. I'm with you. If I have to lean on hyper-realistic versus stylized, it's so much more fun. When you look at Overwatch characters. Some kids are afraid to get an animation because it's constantly like, oh, this software is going to kill animation. Motion capture is going to kill animation. Facial capture is going to kill animation. People worried about facial animation disappearing because of this facial capture software. It's not going anywhere. I've watched facial capture software go from its infancy to some amazing stuff that we're doing today. And there's always going to be a talented facial animator needed. Always. And that's what I've been doing since day one is animating faces. 20 years in the game. Going strong. 20 years, bro. Boom. There's always going to be someone that has to touch that, that makes it that little bit more awesome. And there will always be a job for someone to do that. as long as long you are committed and want to do it. Learn any software, because guess what? Once you've learned one software, you can learn another. And every studio, if they've seen your demo reel and they see your animation and they want your talent, I say it doesn't matter. I think if you know a, a software, that means you can learn another software. Yeah, but what makes a good demo reel when you're looking at candidates and you're looking at demo reels? What's kind of like, all right, these things need to be there. I'm not a fan of people that for an animation demo reel show some highly crazy, awesome rendered character doing something. I want to see some movement in its rawest form. I want to see uh, a blank maquette of a character walk across the screen, pick something up that is heavy, and put it down somewhere else, and then react to what they've just done. As simple as that. Walk on screen, pick up a box, put it on a table, and revel in it, 
hate it. It has to hurt. Doesn't have to hurt. They're super strong and they can do a big heavy box. Something has to happen. They have to come in, pick it up, put it down. I want to see them walk. I want to see them react. I want to see them pick it up. I want to see them react to their pickup. Tell me a story with just that. I don't need some long, someone take, they'll, they'll take like scene from a movie and recreate it. That's funny and all. I'll be like, haha, that's cute. But I want to see, for me, a character come in and do something and give them a couple eyeballs and give them a couple eyebrows. They can just be a vector line. They don't have to be a big hair follicle rendered, ray fracted, whatever. It can be as bare bones as you want. Just make it move right. I love that. That's all you need. I will hire someone. If I have the hire, if I say, you see what that guy did with five polygons? It's amazing. I don't care. Just hire him. He has talent. You can tell the story without having to hide it behind a super awesome high poly model. Mm -hmm. I meant to ask you, that demo reel, Yes. what length would that be ideally, right? Is it like we're talking like 30 seconds, 15 seconds, 20 oh. seconds? Just that, that, that one part of like pick up the thing, go over, drop it off, pick it up. Well, okay. So the, when I was making demo reels, it was a minute. You couldn't go over it. Now, uh, two minutes, 50 seconds, two minutes, 40 seconds. Generally, I just want to see something that's going to catch catch my eye. I mean, I look at my old demo reel on it. It's frightening. When was the last time you made a demo reel? <laughs> How old am I? Uh, hey, shout out to not having to make a demo reel to get work. I've been working for so long. All I say is I, I can tell you the list of games I've made. Mm -hmm. And if you've played that game or if you've seen that game and you like that game, then hire me and I will make something even better for you Bet. tomorrow. Bet. When I was interviewing for EA, they were like, hey, do you have a portfolio? And I'm like, bro, designers don't have portfolio. I mean, I suck at just putting stuff together in general. I'm with you. Anytime somebody, hey, show me what you've done. I could talk you through everything. I can pull up YouTube videos of the things I've built and talk you through from zero to completion. And when, when people are like, Hey, hey, build me a level, take home this test or something like that. Oh, yeah. I bomb those fantastically. Yeah, yeah. And, and I feel like I put so much time into them and they never get me shit. And so it's like now I have a, a straight model. <laughs> you want me to take a test to work for you? Yep. No, thank you. Not really? You won't do a test? Nah, man. Oh, man, it's too good for a test. I'm not too good for a test. It's about knowing your limitations, and that's one of mine. I have like a 0% success rate that's solid. at take-home tests. I can't think of the last time I got a test. Jeez. I, if it's I, a programming I, test, I can I can hit those. But when it's like a, a blank canvas, hey, build me a level in this thing, oh, that's the thing. I'm not a level designer. That's the thing. Not and even level. if you were, like, I'm not going to build you a level. Ugh. It's free work, man. Fuck out of here. You're going to take that level and put it in a game and I'm not going to get a penny. Forget it. Yep. <laughs> I will say this. Bungie had a pretty awesome test, to be fair. Yeah. They had one of the best tests. And that one I can see correlating directly to my job and, and being conversation and talking points. But when I took it, I was what? Was it before Rockstar? Yeah, I, I had only worked at kind of Midway. So my my understanding of the job and and even then, there's so many facets to a designer. Back then, it's just like, hey, you're looking for a game designer? Cool, I'll apply. And they can be 20 different things that they're looking for, right? Now, now I've a bit refined my area of specialty, and I know I can suss it out when I'm speaking to a recruiter. That's awesome. That's the thing. When I get a recruiter or, or I get someone interviewing me, all I got to do is be honest. If I'm getting interviewed by someone and I know what games you guys make, I know whether or not we're going to be a fit. I think yeah. the main thing is the team, are you putting me with people that we're going to be able to work with each other. Right now, the team I'm with, we have it down. I think if, if I could stay with this team forever, I would be with the team I'm with forever right now. The team is great. Is any of that loss virtually? Like your dynamic, your ability to kind of... We fought hard to, to keep our dynamic, to keep our fun. We, have, we were given our own Zoom channel, so we weren't limited to the 45-minute Zoom chats so that we can hang out and chat throughout the day. Do you guys do that? You just have it on yeah. in the background? When we were at the studio, it was the coffee train. I'd get up. I'd be the engine. Let's get up and get a coffee. And everyone would get behind me. And we'd start the coffee train. And it'd be like, let's do this. And the same people that we used to get up, we started the coffee train. And now not all of them come to every Zoom meeting when we have them. But we just click at the, the coffee train channel and say, hey, I'm on the, the Zoom. Let's 
catch up. Let's see how everyone's doing. Because I think it, it's definitely, uh, I, I'm feeling the isolation. I'm feeling it. I love that, bro. I, I, I call you a culture builder, man, or a team builder for sure, because I'm definitely the type of guy that would be headphones on, cranking away at the desk, working in my own little yeah. bubble whenever I'm on something. So to have somebody come over, snap me out of it, yo, let's take a break, let's go for a walk, yes. let's get some air. That yes. shit is just like an instant jolt to the creative oh, juices. Yeah, IDOS just built a brand new studio and they had this huge staircase in the middle of the studio. We call I call it the Steria. And, and we'd sit on those stairs and drink our coffee and everyone walking by, we'd say hi to them and they'd be like, ah, oh, I miss it, I miss it. Hey, we'll get back there one day, man. Hey, but you enjoy this no commute thing, I imagine. Yes, I'm an hour from the studio, so not having to drive 96 kilometers there and then 96 kilometers back is uh, definitely a, a windfall. Given the option, mm. what would be your ideal work situation? Three days a week. In the studio? Yeah, three days in the studio, two days. Three. Uh, okay, let's say anywhere from three days studio or three days home, but at least two days in the studio a week. Yeah, or even alternating, right? Like yeah. three days in studio, next week, three days at home. Yeah, that'd be sweet. And then you, yeah, because I think all you really need is to cross pollinate with the teams, right? Like, hey, when are you guys going to be in the office? I want to make sure I'm there the same time you guys are there. And if you're home, then yeah, I can be home too. Well, I'm involved in the mocap studio. I, I had to, at the time, physically be there to, to prep the actors and I had gotten so deep into technical, dude. I had learned so much stuff. It's like, I think I might be getting dumber and not being there. I think I should turn part of the studio into a mocap studio, maybe. Make some money on the side. Yeah, man. You could do that. Process, you process some data. You can build. I know you can fucking build anything. I'm surprised <laughs> you don't have a fucking 3D printer. Dude, I just got my connector cable to use a Connect to use the camera from Connect on the computer. You can use that for rudimentary motion capture. That, that's a thing, right? Because it knows the bones. Yep. It knows your hands. It knows your head. And how far does it go down? It gets your feet? If you can point it at the point where it has the whole body in the shot, you can capture full body motion capture with it. Holy shit, man. I have my, my Xbox One Connect camera like about to go to Goodwill or something. I might hold on to that thing. It's just look seriously type it in connect motion capture and like they have people that it's all you just plug it into your computer you need to get a special adapter to plug it into your computer at least the old one you do yeah and uh dude i've been putting it off but i have it i'm gonna start i was gonna start playing with that now that i have my studio space here we could talk forever man i really appreciate your time i want to respect your time yep. all right brother uh ritual that we have here on the show is yep. if you had a good time and right. you want to pay it forward, nominate somebody who you want to put in the hot seat and throw them out of play area. I really want you to talk to Anton. Antoine Tisdale. Ooh, you've been called out, Antoine. I love that guy, man. He, he's ducking me. I've thrown a few messages to his way. I told him, make time. He knows. I right, bet. Time. Bet. Designer extraordinaire. Is he still at IDOS? He's still at IDOS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still get to see him now and then on Zoom meetings and whatnot. Nice. You guys work together. That's beautiful. All right. Antoine Tisdale coming at you. I'll drink to that. I so enjoyed speaking with you, Geiger. I love you. I miss you, man. I hope to see you again soon across the border. Absolutely. Thank you for coming on Out of Play. I had a great time. We'll do it again. Take care, brother. Take care. I love connecting with people like Geiger, who remind you that this industry is full of amazing, wonderful human beings. Something that resonated with me was the way that he made the choice to actively change his perspective and enjoy his job, allowing him to bring his best self and maximum effort to the task at hand for the people around him. A big reason for this show is for me to appreciate the various disciplines and departments that it takes to build a game. And I loved hearing more about what goes into video game animation. Let me also clarify that my particular view on interview tests is if the test is not something that I like to do, if it's a level design test, I'll save both me and the employer time and say no thank you. Now that aside, I do believe interview tests are extremely valuable. They enable your team to have a conversation around something you've built so that they can better assess what you can bring to the team in as little time as they have in getting to know you on the interview. Truth be told, I mean, I think it also empowers you, the candidate, 
to steer the conversation into the areas of your personal strength. And if you care to even highlight areas that you can improve upon and want to get better at, right? It still shows them that you are aware of your shortcomings and you have a plan to improve. Did y'all catch the part about jumping ship once his employer tried to cut his pay? There are times in this business where taking less money to do the thing you want to do can be a short-term sacrifice for long-term gain. However, it's important to know your worth and stand up for yourself because when it comes to money, no one else is going to do that. I've seen that happen and we need to advocate for ourselves and our teammates when we see it so that they should always know their worth. In his career and up to now in IDOS, Geiger's been living the dream and bringing emotion to game protagonists and iconic characters like Lara Croft herself. How sweet is that? This industry is demanding. Let's not lie to ourselves about that, like other creative industries. But for everybody who manages to hang on, who can navigate these vicious waters, stand up for yourself, know your worth, and build trust among your team, you'll live to work on some amazing things that surpass even your wildest dreams. And that's the magic of this amazing industry. In episode six, debuting on Monday, April the 12th, senior systems designer at Sony's Ben Studio, Nick Zipman, falls out of play area and talks through systems he's designed on Days Gone. We reminisce on his days in Amsterdam working for Guerrilla on Horizon Zero Dawn. And we'll also talk about his time on Saints Row doing tech design at Felicia. Of course, I'm going to take advantage and journey down memory lane shipping the 2010 game of the year, Red Dead Redemption, while we were both at Rockstar San Diego. We'll also talk at a high level about open world game design and even touch base on what we can do as Full Sail alumni to give back to our alma mater and help improve the curriculum to better prepare the next generation to stay current on development trends. Thank you for listening. If you found it enlightening and enjoyed the show, I'd appreciate your support in following the podcast or leaving a review or telling a fellow developer about the show. Every bit helps get this out there and raise awareness. If you have any thoughts, comments, questions for me or a guest, you can email them to me at john at outofplayarea.com or call in and leave a message at 760-981-0311. Both links are readily available at the top of our homepage at outofplayarea.com. If you're a game developer who's willing to share their knowledge or story, click on the Calendly button on our site and let's link up. Please make sure to get approval from your studio PR or HR team before. How to Play Every releases new episodes every other Monday on all the major platforms, including Apple, Google, and Spotify. Please make sure to follow so that you see what developer pushes out of play area next time. I'm your host, John Diaz. Till next time, devs, stay strong, stay true, stay dangerous. We out.